Hello and welcome to the final talk of our online series, Behind the Scenes Analyzing Anglo-Saxon Rendlesham. I'm Alice DeLeo, the Project Delivery Officer at Suffolk County Council Archaeological Service, and today we'll be hearing from Keith Wade about Anglo-Saxon Ipswich. We're excited to be hosting this online series in partnership with two projects. Rendlesham Revealed, led by Suffolk County Council Archaeological Service, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and Lordship and Landscape, led by Christopher Skull and funded by the Leverhulme Trust. You can find the videos of our earlier talks on our website at heritage.suffolk.gov.uk forward slash Rendlesham. So I'll now introduce you to Keith Wade. Keith is a well-known local archaeologist. In 1974, he was the urban archaeologist for the Suffolk Archaeological Unit. During his time there, he directed 36 excavations at 34 sites within the historic core of Ipswich Town, which produced an archive of national and international importance. In 1991, he became the county archaeologist at Suffolk County Council until his retirement in 2012. He continues to be involved with the archaeology of the town through the Ipswich Archaeological Trust, which he founded in 1982 and he is currently completing a volume which summarises the evidence for Anglo-Saxon Ipswich. We're very pleased to have Keith, Keith as part of this online series talking about the historical development of Ipswich to set everything that we've learned about so far about Rendlesham into its wider context. So Keith, when you're ready, over to you. <coughs> yes, thank you, Alice. Um, as Alice just said, this last lecture in the series is not actually about Rendlesham itself, but rather the contemporary site of Anglo-Saxon Ipswich and its possible relationship to the Royal Ville. There are only three documentary references to Ipswich prior to the Doomsday Book of 1086. So what we know about the Anglo-Saxon town is based almost entirely on archaeological evidence. And unlike Rendlesham, clearly that evidence hasn't been collected through field walking and metal detecting, neither of which are possible in towns, but through the excavation of sites when they come up for redevelopment. And as Alice has mentioned, most of the evidence for Ipswich was collected in the 36 excavations shown here, which were undertaken between 1974 and 1990 by Suffolk County Council's Archaeological Service under my direction. And all the dots represent excavations and the red areas were the large scale excavations that were possible. As you can see, it's a fairly uniform, we're lucky really, it's a fairly uniform distribution of sites, which could give us, gives us about uh, a 3% sample of the total area. But let us start with some background. Um, Ipswich lies at the tidal reach of the Orwell estuary, some 11 miles from the open sea. It is arguably the best harbour for sea traffic from the European mainland going north from the Thames. You will see here um, also on, on this map, Rendlesham, these are Roman sites in relation to Rendlesham and Sutton Hoo and Ipswich. Unlike nearby Colchester, the town of Ipswich does not have Roman origins. But during the Roman period, Ipswich Borough was an area of fairly intensively populated countryside. As you can see on this uh, map, it lay just east of the main road between the major towns of Colchester and Caister by Norwich, with the minor town of Coddenham six miles to the north, and the late Roman coastal fort and substantial settlement of Walton Felixstowe to the southeast at the mouth of the Orwell estuary. A Roman road must have linked Felixstowe to the Coddenham area, and this road is likely to have passed through Ipswich, possibly crossing the urban core from southeast to northwest, and from there along the Norwich Road. Now, as we heard in Jude Pluvier's talk, the most significant Roman site in the borough is the villa complex at Castle Hill Witten, that's at the top of this, this map. 
This is the largest known villa in Suffolk, and it seems to date from the second century with considerable expansion and refurbishment during the fourth century. And it continued in use right to the end of the Roman period in the early fifth century. As we heard from Jude, it's likely that the villa estate took over many of the smaller farmsteads across the borough during the third and fourth centuries. And it has been suggested that the estate owner may have had links to the administration of the late Roman military coastal defence system. After the end of Roman rule in the early fifth century, we know of two early Anglo-Saxon settlements within the borough and two cemeteries. Shown here on the left hand side of the map in relation to what is currently Ipswich Town Centre and the later town, which we'll talk about in a minute on the right. So we have the Hadley Road Cemetery excavated in 1906-7. The Boss Hall Cemetery excavated in 1990. The Hanford Road Settlement excavated in 2003. And a second possible settlement at Wallers Grove to the south there, where a brooch and pottery was found during development on the Chantry Estate in 1950. And those are shown in relation to the Orwell, as you can see running through below Ipswich Town. And you can see it bifurcating as it goes past the town with Hanford Road on, on the north side of that part of the River Gipping. At the Hadley Road Cemetery, um, 159 inhumation and 13 cremation burials were recorded, dating from the 6th century to the middle of the 7th century. These are some of the artefacts from that cemetery. The grave goods included a gilded silver disc brooch with inlaid garnets, a silver necklet, which you can see here, shield pendants, square headed brooches shown here, annular brooches, buckles, shield bosses, spearheads, iron knives, bone combs, glass vessels shown here, beads and pottery urns also shown. At the Boss Hall Cemetery, most of the burials are typical of the 6th century with cruciform and small long brooches, wrist clasps, girdle hangers and amber and glass beads. One 7th century burial was of a woman of a wealthy and important family. The grave goods included this composite brooch with cloisonne garnets and coins including a base gold Merovingian royal solidus of Sigebert III minted at Marseille, which was mounted as a pendant. A set of silver cosmetic implements, a necklace of gold and gold alloy pendants, silver and glass beads. The Hanford Road settlement lies, as I indicated on a previous slide, on the banks of the northern arm of the River Gipping on the site of earlier Roman settlement. At least 10 buildings were identified, obviously only, it's only part of the, the settlement that was excavated, including both halls and sunken featured buildings dating from the 5th to the early 7th century. And you can see them on here, the, the um, outlined in yellow or in, <coughs> coloured in yellow are the halls and in red are the sunken featured buildings. This is one of the halls of individual post hole construction. And this is one of the large sunken featured buildings, also used to be called Gruben House or Gruben Häuser. Now these are typical of early Anglo-Saxon settlements in East Anglia, of which the type site shown here, West Stow, which has been reconstructed and you can go and visit it, um, is, is the uh, best example. Now, the Hadley Road Cemetery probably served the Hanford Road settlement. And it has been suggested that it controlled access down the Gipping Valley, certainly in the 6th century. The Hadley Road Cemetery is unusual in that it has these square headed brooches rather than the typical cruciform brooches, which are the norm in East Anglian cemeteries of this period, including at the nearby Boss Hall. Also, the cremation urns are plain or decorated only with bosses, 
in contrast to the highly decorated urns from other cemeteries. This has been interpreted as representing some form of intrusive or separatist group from Kent or even southern Scandinavia. A study of the pottery stamps present at the Hanford Road settlement suggests that the site was a trading or even diplomatic outpost for merchants or kingdoms further north. Whether the function of the Hanford Road settlement was related in any way to what was happening at Rendlesham in the 6th century remains to be seen and hopefully as the uh, project continues um, that may become clearer. However, in the middle of the 7th century, all the occupation moves to the present site of Ipswich Town. <clears throat> a little is known about the actual settlement at this period, but the distribution of 7th century pottery suggests that it was restricted to some perhaps 10 hectares north of the river, with cemeteries to the north at the Butter Market and south of the Orwell at Stoke Quay. And you can see here the, the black dots represent finds of um, 7th century handmade pottery. Um, you can see the Butter Market Cemetery there just to the north of those finds and then south of the river, the Stoke Quay Cemetery. And on the eastern edge of this uh, site two in Four Street, excavation revealed field, three field boundaries of 7th century date containing spelt wheat but a lack of domestic refuse which is highly suggestive that they were arable field boundaries. The only excavation producing buildings of this period in the likely area of occupation is at site one there, the Novotel site just north of Stoke Bridge. Now two sunken featured buildings were found on this excavation and they're this rectangular red blobs there and many pits containing handmade pottery and pottery imported from the Rhine and Scheldt areas of mainland Europe. This is a uh, typical group. In the top left there you can see the grass tempered or chaff tempered uh, handmade pottery and the rest of those <coughs> sherds are wheel made kiln fired imports from the largely mainly from the Rhine and but also from the Scheldt area. Just to the south of this site excavations at Bridge Street revealed two contemporary timber structures forming the earliest revetments along the original riverbank. Now the Butter Market Cemetery which lay uh, north of this occupation area has been fully published by Chris Skull. You can see the front cover here, Society for Medieval Archaeology Monograph 27. It comprised 71 graves and estimated perhaps only as a quarter of what had been there, the rest being destroyed by all the later occupation. And five of those surviving graves lay under small barrows you can see on the plan there the circular ditches that surrounded those uh, those burials. Now the limits of this cemetery were not found in any direction. It's quite likely that it was a good deal bigger. This is one of the uh, burials under a small barrow. Now radiocarbon dating shows that the cemetery starts between 610 and 635 and ended uh, between 660 and 690. <clears throat> Excuse me. The burials were mostly adults, both male and female, and most were in wooden coffins, containers or chambers. Two were in small dugout boats, three metres long, which are not common in Britain, but widespread in Holland, Northern France, Belgium and Switzerland between the 5th and the 7th century. Three of the male graves contained continental belt suites paralleled in Belgium and Northern France. Only two other such belt suites have been found in England from Southampton and London 
and they indicate the presence of high status individuals of Frankish origin. The Stoke Key Cemetery south of the river has also just been published in the East Anglian Archaeology series by Oxford Archaeology and Preconstruct Archaeology. It comprised 22 graves dating from about 650 to 720 AD, including both males and females, and up to nine under barrows. And again, you can see the <clears throat> circular ditches around the graves of, of those barrow burials. Now, isotope analysis has shown that two of those buried under barrows originated in the area of Denmark, France and the Low Countries. In other words, they were of Frankish or Frisian origin. So what can we conclude about the nature of the 7th century occupation at Ipswich? As only two buildings have been found, it's difficult to judge whether the settlement was physically different from other local settlements. Both were sunken featured buildings, which are, as we've seen, the common building type in the early Anglo-Saxon period in East Anglia. And no examples are known from the Middle Saxon settlements as defined by the association with its which were pottery. However, they are not the predominant two or six post type found on early Anglo-Saxon settlements. It has been argued that the sunken features in the two and six post types was an underfloor space, whereas sunken features with evidence of post holes along the edges, like this example from its switch, are more likely to indicate floors on the base of the sunken features, with the sides of the pits being retained by a wicker lining. Now, evidence for pit lining in early Anglo-Saxon sunken featured buildings in England is rare but is more common on the continent, for example, at Weister in Holland, where the majority of the sunken features had evidence of pit lining. The objects associated with the, this 7th century occupation in Ipswich, however, are typical of those from other early Anglo-Saxon settlements in terms of evidence of spinning and weaving in the form of spindle whirls and loom weights. Lava quernstone fragments, bone needles, antler combs, iron knives, and in this case, iron roves, presumably from boats, not surprising in this location. So is this 7th, early 8th century occupation in Ipswich just another typical village of the early Ang earlier Anglo-Saxon period in East Anglia? The nature of the pottery assemblage shows that it certainly is not. The large quantity and dominance of shaft tempered pottery is unique to date in Suffolk. And similarly, the large quantity of imported wares is rare and highly significant. Now, organic tempered pottery is common in the south of England from the 5th to the 7th centuries, but it rarely forms more than 15% of assemblages north of the Thames in the 7th century, including Suffolk. The high proportion of chaff tempered wares at Ipswich has not yet been found on any other East Anglian site of this period. However, chaff tempered pottery is common on late 7th, early 8th century sites in coastal Flanders. And these pottery assemblages are very similar to the assemblage at Ipswich, being handmade wares dominated by chaff tempering and imported wares from the Eiffel region change into classic Bardolf type wares in the middle of the 8th century as it does in Ipswich. It could therefore be argued that the occupation represents Frankish or Frisian traders in residence. Also, the percentage of imported pottery is high at 15% and higher than in the later Middle Saxon period when 5% is imported. The same two imports occur in both the 7th century and earlier Middle Saxon groups. North French blackwares, that's, this is an example of North French blackware, and early Bardolfwares from the Rhineland. 
The large proportion of imported pottery associated with the 7th century occupation at Ipswich is in sharp contrast to, to, sharp contrast to that found to date on rural 7th century settlements across the East Anglian Kingdom. Although admittedly only a limited number have so far been excavated. At the 6th, 7th century settlement excavated at Bloodmore Hill, Carlton, Colville in North East Suffolk, there were only 20 sherds of imported pottery representing three vessels, which is only 0.3% of the total pottery. And it is of interest that no imported wares have been reported from any other early Anglo-Saxon settlements to date in East Anglia. The Bloodmore Hill settlement may be an exception as it is associated with high status female graves and it is assumed to be an estate centre. Well, it is assumed that the large proportion of imported wares from 7th century Ipswich arrive as equipment brought by traders for their own use rather than trade items such as lava quernstones and wine. By the 690s, Frisian merchant seamen are actually recorded visiting England. Although foreign traders in Rhenish goods were undoubtedly present in Ipswich, it is doubtful whether exchange took place within the settlement. As we heard in Andy Wood's talk, there are only a few primary shatters in Ipswich, but lots from the so-called productive sites such as Rendlesham, and the nearby Coddenham and Barham. This implies that Ipswich was a base for foreign traders from which they journeyed to defined places in the kingdom where exchange was permitted, such as royal villes. As we've seen, three of the male individuals in the Buttermarket Cemetery were clearly of high status and of Frankish origin, explaining perhaps the frequent use of other continental burial practice. Chris Skull sees this as indicating that a significant proportion of the population, including continental magnates, was probably engaged in overseas trade. However, there are other reasons why foreigners would be found at such an international port. Foreign visitors were frequent at the courts of the Anglo-Saxon kings and wider nobility. Marriage alliances between the royal houses of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and the Franks are known. And there was significant interchange of envoys on business of all kinds, including trade agreements. Foreign scholars and ecclesiastics were also frequent visitors. Now, care was needed prior to such meetings for the safety of the hosts. The precautions described in Beowulf before newcomers were allowed into the king's presence included a full background check, disclosure of the nature of the business and the need to go to the meeting without weapons. This would imply that landing places were restricted by the king and that onward journeys inland were strictly controlled for the safety of both parties. The lack of evidence for buildings of this period within uh, the 7th century Ipswich other than the two, two we saw at uh, the Novotel site, it's hard to reconcile with permanent settlement. However, clearly only limited excavation has been possible, so this remains an open question. Having said that, trading was a seasonal activity, and it is quite possible that tents were used for accommodating a population swollen in the summer months. An example of a seasonal trading site is known at Gazir on the north coast of Iceland at a later period, the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. Here a series of sunken featured buildings excavated on the shore were used as accommodation for foreign ships crews for a few weeks in the summer trading season. These sunken features have accumulations of occupation debris, including imported pottery, but no wooden superstructure, implying that they were covered by tents. The merchants were provisioned with food brought to the site, including cattle. The lack of evidence for monetary exchange implies the prearranged exchange of goods between the elites of Iceland 
and those in Norway rather than commerce. Clearly in the period from about 640 to 720, Ipswich was an arrival point for foreign visitors in the summer months. And from which they traveled to royal estates for various purposes, including the exchange of goods. Whether it was the sole entry point for the whole East Anglian Kingdom remains to be seen, and other such places may well have existed along the coasts and rivers of the kingdom. However, at the present time, there are no hints of other places in East Anglia with the distinctive cultural signature present in Ipswich at this period. And the same is true in the other kingdoms served by the Wick sites of London and Southampton. <clears throat> now, between about 700 and 750 AD, there was a major expansion of settlement to cover some 50 hectares both north and south of the river into Stoke, outlined here by the dotted line. The new town, largely constructed both across and to the north of the Buttermarket Cemetery, comprised a gridiron pattern of streets with a possible market on the Cornhill and its possible Royal Chapel, St Mildred, and at the other end, we shall see uh, a pottery industry. Most of these streets continue to the present day. It implies planning by a central authority, which we've always assumed would be the East Anglian Royal House from its base at Rendlesham. All sites excavated across the town have provided consistent evidence of international trade and a wide range of craft activities spanning the period from about 730 to 850. Craft production included bone and antler working, chiefly comb making, metal working, textile production witnessed by loom weights like these, spindle whorls, and leather working. But it was dominated by pottery production. The distinctive pottery called Ipswich Ware was mass produced south of Car Street and distributed throughout eastern England and beyond, demonstrating the area of economic influence which the town had at that time. The industry was no doubt concentrated in the area south of Car Street, but the only kilns to have been excavated so far were at the Butter Market site and at Stoke Quay. This is the kiln excavated at the butter market. And this is the kiln excavated at Stoke Quay. The butter market kiln was producing an unusual form of its ware pictures, as seen here. International trade is indicated by large amounts of pottery from northern France, Belgium and the Rhineland and lava quernstones from the Rhineland. This is uh, a Bardolfware amphora from the uh, Rhineland. And this is half a Rhenish lava quernstone. The pottery probably represents a wine trade, and this would have arrived in barrels, some of which have been excavated in Ipswich, reused as well linings, such as this one. Um, we know it's uh, a Rhenish wine barrel because the only match for the tree rings is the Mainz area of Germany. So what does it all mean? Well, for those of you who, uh, who didn't know, of course, town life existed in Roman Britain, but it disappeared during the fifth and sixth centuries with the Anglo-Saxons being sort of self-sufficient rural folk, which makes Ipswich one of only a handful of towns which can demonstrate origins as early as the 8th century. And there appears to be one for each of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, which makes a lot of sense. For Wessex, you can see here we have Southampton or Hamwick. Uh, for Northumberland, we have York or Eothelwick. As we've seen, Ipswich, Gippiswick served East Anglia. And Kent was served by at least 
Sandwich or Sondwick and Fordwich, Fordwick. And London, Lundenwick served Essex firstly and then Mercia. The Wick element of their place names probably indicates a trading settlement. The sites on mainland Europe with which these towns traded are also known. We have Quentevic in the Par de Calais, trading with Southampton or Hamwick. We have Dorstadt on the Rhine and Domburg, trading across with Ipswich and London. And Haderby in Schleswig-Holstein, trading across probably with, to York, the Orphawick. And you can see also marked on there the Rhineland area where so much of the pottery, wine, and lava quernstones derives. Projecting into the river, uh, excavations on Ipswich waterfront have revealed timber landing stages very similar to those excavated at the continental sites of Dorstadt and Haderby. This is the quite uh, remarkable series of landing stages in the River Rhine at Dorstadt. Now, I'm sure it's which was nowhere near as, as large as this, but uh, it looks as though we have a very similar um, means of unloading cargo. This founding of its, which is an international port and craft production centre in the early 8th century, appears to coincide with the sudden decline of activity at Rendlesham, as we've seen on Andy Wood's talk on the coinage. And the two things must surely be connected. Many of the functions performed at Rendlesham and other royal villes in the 7th century are transferred to Ipswich, where a truly market based economy develops. We already know from Rendlesham, although there's any limited excavation, it like it, that it was likely to have been an exchange centre, a central place for exchange and indeed for certain amounts of craft production. In saying that, obviously we are now looking in more detail at the rebirth of towns in this in in this country um, and this maybe can serve as a model for the other parts of the country in other words that the royal villes perform these functions in the perhaps the sixth uh, and seventh centuries but then in all areas in all kingdoms deliberate towns are founded like Ipswich um, to act as craft production centers and centres for international trade. Now, Ipswich is the only one that uh, continued, in fact, on the same site. Um, it continued to thrive during the Danish occupation in the late 9th century and remained in the top 10 most important towns in England until the Norman conquest. <clears throat> <clears throat> By the mid 12th century, the town had dropped 21st in the town rankings as it suffered competition from other towns in Suffolk and East Anglia, which reduced its hinterland to southeast Suffolk. Never again would it recapture its Middle Saxon importance. Thank you.